Hello and welcome to this new episode of Meet the Experts. Today we're going to go on a journey to discover how low latency MPEG DASH works behind the scenes. What differentiates traditional DASH from low latency DASH? How does CMAF allow you to reduce distribution latency? How much latency is added by the various components of the distribution chain and why? These are some of the questions we are going to address during this episode of Meet the Experts. To discuss this topic, I have the pleasure of welcoming Yannick Brogno, Senior Solution Engineer for ATEM based in New York. Yannick, could you walk us through the reference workflow that will be used to both define the problem we are trying to solve and bring some key elements to address these challenges? Hi Clément and everyone watching. Thanks for having me. So yes, let's jump right in. We'll start with an acquisition signal which can originate from a satellite feed over SDI for example. That content is ingested into a linear encoder, creating a multi-bit rate ladder, which is ultimately pushed to an origin packager server. That server is connected to the internet backbone, which is why we call it over the top or OTT. Finally, some cache servers, which are part of a content delivery network, will serve the content in the form of video segments to the end user's devices through the last mile network. This talk will be divided into four parts. First, as part of the initial problem statement, we'll gain an understanding of what distribution latency is, or in this case, the latency from the input of the encoder to the actual video shown to the viewer. We'll also get a sense of which workflow components contribute most to the 28 second latency, which we'll call the traditional workflow. We will see how segment packaging on the one side and player buffering on the other each play an important role in the overall latency. We looked at segment creation performed by the packager, which receives the video content coming from the encoder and send it to the network upon request. We then looked at the player and how it buffers content before displaying it. Then, as part of the proposed solution, we'll compare it to a low latency MPEG DASH workflow to see how the total latency can be decreased down to eight seconds. We will analyze the mechanism of the origin packager where small pieces of content or chunks are created. Then see how those chunks are transferred over the CDN via HTTP chunk transfer encoding. And finally, how the player uses its buffer to process those chunks. We'll finally conclude this episode by describing some of the challenges low latency streaming poses and technologies being researched to further lower the latency as well as to improve the stability of the playback. Before diving more deeply into the technical aspects of latency, let's explore why latency is such a hot topic in the video streaming industry. More specifically, for which video applications is this most critical and the main drivers of this technology? Live sports streaming has been a catalyst for low latency. One obvious reason for that is what we call the spoiler effect. So this is when you hear about a touchdown or a goal from someone receiving the same program nearby their broadcast, for example, before you actually see it. Another major demand for low latency comes from applications revolving around betting and gambling, which are still tied to live sports events. Interactive use cases also require low latency. These include live game streaming, home shopping network, or even social media broadcasting. There is also what we call the second screen experience, where users react to what they are watching on their main TV screen, through social media on their laptop or on handheld devices. Ultimately, for all these use cases, latency can be an interactivity killer. There is one last example which is usually more strategic than practical. That is when the streaming platforms push for low latency simply as a differentiator from their competitors and soon just to stay on par with them. Yes, and as you've just said, Yannick, nowadays many applications work better with low latency and achieving low latency is paramount for live streaming scenarios. In a 2019 survey, developers were asked what technology was the most challenging when it came to implementing end-to-end -end OTT workflows. 
The results clearly show that this ever-growing demand comes along with an ever-growing complexity, more specifically when it comes to addressing this latency decrease, since it affects all the components of the distribution chain – encoders, packagers, CDN, all the way down to players. Now let's take a step back and understand what the fundamental reason is for having such a high latency in the over-the-top world, especially compared to traditional broadcasts. When we talk about over-the-top, we are referring to over the internet. What is the internet? It's actually an unmanaged network, meaning we don't have control over its bandwidth, its workload, and its overall performance. This is where player buffering comes in. To avoid playback incidents in case of network congestion, which would affect the quality of experience, the playback software buffers the media stream directly on the client's device. Therefore, if the stream is interrupted or slowed down due to the network, the player will use its buffer to fill in the gap while switching to a lower profile. Once the network goes back to its full potential throughput, the players switch back to the top profile. So ultimately, the bigger the buffer, the more robust the playback will be to absorb network variations. But at the same time, the more latency there will be. So if I understand well, we have a trade-off to make. A trade-off between the robustness of the service on the one hand and the latency of that service on the other. If we prioritize a solid and sturdy service that can overcome bandwidth fluctuation in the last mile network, then the player needs to buffer more video data ahead of time meaning more latency to absorb the bandwidth degradation and switch to a lower video profile. If we prefer to have a video service as close as possible to what we call the live edge, then the player will need to buffer as little data as possible and may therefore take the risk of suffering from buffer starvation, service disruption, rebuffering, or however you want to call it. In this section, we'll break down the total latency into its various components, starting with a 6-second media segment with a total distribution latency of 28 seconds. Yeah, so now, let's look at a traditional OTT workflow and map the latency over each of the main components. So we have four main buckets corresponding to four different functions in that workflow. Each of them has its own impact on latency. First, the encoding stage which accounts for about 3 seconds in the overall latency. This is mainly related to the encoding parameters, such as the use of B-frames, the look-ahead, the VBV. Next, OTT packaging, which is the creation of the segments themselves. The latency added in this phase is the time it takes for the continuous stream coming from the encoder to be packaged into discrete dash segments and be made available to the CDN. So it is directly related to the segment duration, which in our case is 6 seconds. Then comes the CDN propagation, or the time it takes for the IP packets to leave the packager, transit through the internet routers, and reach the end user devices. And this is usually negligible, but we have accounted for about 1 second here. And the last component, but certainly not the least, is the playback buffering. That is the amount of data that the end device will need to keep locally in its buffer before starting to display the content. So by default, most players follow the original HLS specifications, requiring three segments buffer. But for Dash, there are no such requirements, and it is up to the implementation of each player. So here we have a six second segment times three segments, which results in an 18 second latency. The player buffering is required to compensate for network variations, as we saw earlier, but these typically occur in the last mile network. So we can say that the last mile network is usually where most of the bandwidth fluctuation happens, especially for mobile users. So now the main question becomes, on which of these stages can we improve latency in the most efficient manner? It seems that the two components that stand out and add most of the latency are the packaging, and playback buffering, which, when combined, account for 24 out of the 28 second latency. Looking more closely at these two components, we see that their common denominator is the segment duration, which we'll take a look at in the next section.
So having said that, Yannick, and before we go any further into latency considerations, I suggest we get a better grasp on what a media segment is, what it's composed of, its internal structure, and how it will ultimately influence the latency added by both the packaging and the playback buffering process. So the origin packager receives various types of frame from the encoder, starting with the IDR, the instantaneous decode refresh, and followed by the predictive and bidirectional frames. Once the packager receives a certain number of these frames, it will encapsulate them into a media segment, which is 6 seconds in our case. One fundamental characteristic of media segments is that they must start with an IDR frame, in order to be independent from one another, and also since they will be used downstream for bitrate switching. Media segments are organized into boxes. The box holding the video frames is called the MDAT, for media data, but the decoder needs a table of content in order to delimit those frames. So this table is called the MOOF or the movie fragment. So the MOOF indicates to the decoder where to find the start of each frame forming the MDAT box inside the segment. That format defining the structure and the boxes encapsulating the frames is called ISO Base Media File Format, or ISO BMFF for short, or even fragmented MP4. But what makes this format so popular? For example, compared to the MPEG transport stream, which is the media container used in Apple HLS? Yes, it's a great question, and that comparison with MPEG TS is appropriate to better understand the advantages offered by ISO BMFF and its data model. With ISO BMFF, the metadata, so the MOOF, is separated from the video data, the MDAT, while all media are interleaved in small PID packets in the case of the MPEG transport stream. So this makes ISO BMFF more suitable for editing, searching, and repackaging when compared to MPEG TS. Thus, it's growing popularity in the OTT streaming industry. Now that we have seen how ISO BMFF or Fragmented MP4 is defined and why it has been widely adopted, let's focus on what CMAF is and how it relates to these standards. Yes, yeah, so to really understand what CMAF is, we need to understand the original problem it intends to solve. To do this, let's rewind back in time to 2016, when the two HTTP adaptive streaming dominant solutions were HLS and Dash. We ended up having two workflows running in parallel to serve video content to a wide variety of users, one serving the Apple's operating system via HLSTS and the M3 U8 playlist, and the other workflow serving Androids and the other OSs via MPEG Dash ISO BMFF and the MPD manifest. These two coexisting standards eventually forced broadcasters to duplicate storage and compute resources to produce two copies of the very same content, one in MPEG TS and the other in Fragmented MP4. Then, a common media format came along, which not only allowed Apple to move away from the MPEG transport stream, but most importantly, finally gave broadcasters the option of using a single copy of the media files, which could be addressed by the two manifest formats in use. This common media application format, or CMAP for short, then enable broadcasters to cut back on cost, simplify workflows, and reduce latency by using media chunks, which we'll touch on later in this talk. What is also very important to understand is that CMAF does not specify the format of the manifest, M3U8 defined by HLS and MPD defined by Dash. It is instead a subset of the ISO BMFF standard that specifies constraints of the media container and its associated encryption scheme. 